once upon a time. Um, what is then uh, totally destroyed? Time? It's a fairly new uh, discipline. Um, is it, for instance, multimedia with a nice new frock and sexy label? Is it interim communications with delusions of grandeur? Or is it, you know, typical American artifacty academic and it's going to be <laughs> I suspect it's a bit of an old thing, to be honest. In the late 80s and early 90s, um, various creative groups and individuals were developing stories that ran across multiple forms of media. While turning new pieces, new pieces of the story to each channel. Each of these pieces were not only linked to each other, but were also narratively synchronized with each other. This phenomenon was given a name called Transmedia by Professor Mark Kunde in 1991, there she is. <laughs> she called initiatives to use this idea commercial transmedia super systems. And she went on to say that transmedia intertextuality works to position consumers as powerful players while disavowing commercial manipulation. which we think, I think, is a bit of this. However, 12 years later, a guy called Professor Henry Jenkins at MIT <coughs> used the term transmitter storytelling and decided that it was, in fact, coordinated use of storytelling across platforms to make the characters more compelling. So transmedia uh, is, by extension, developing a story of stories across many media forms of media that are linked and related. Now this might just sound like a, a version of traditional cross-media uh, uh, franchises, sequels or adaptations, but in fact it's not, like from distance. This discipline is sometimes called multi-platform storytelling, and it's been around, actually, for many, many years. In the years, say, The Shadow, for example, which is, uh, which is a, a sort of Part superhero, part of supernatural crime story. Uh, first appeared in the 30s, and these stories started on radio, and then also appeared in pulp magazines, and then spread across a wide range of media, including comic books, comic strips, and at least five motion pictures. More recently, Star Wars has taken their story into all sorts of transmedia areas, from, from the basic film, as you can see, top left, all the way down to uh, Lego again, which is strange. But again, these are all different. These are all one story told from different perspectives using different mediums. Transmedia, transmedia builds worlds that ignore the constraints to appear and thrive on some platforms. Unlike old school promotions, spin-offs, and this this new creature extends rather than adapts storylines. It tells various parts of the story, creating distinct media that explores the inequalities unique to it. A TV show you're hooked on will have a subplot on the web and a further collection of character development in a graphic novel, for instance. Transmedia producers plan for multiple platforms from the very beginning. They design fictional universes from the get go that are consistent with everywhere the audience engages with them. In Hollywood, it's already changed in the industry. The Producers Guild of America, which represents production staff in TV, film, and online, has ratified a new credit transmedia producer. Here's an interesting example of a filmmaker who uses transmedia to enrich the story. Excuse me, Mr. Smith, could I just ask you to speak a little bit slower because there's lots of French people okay. who are having difficulty understanding. So slower you. and Please. less of a Scouse accent. Okay. <laughs> Head Trauma then. Head Trauma was a film uh, late, uh, early 2000s. It's a film about a drifter who inherits his mother's home and starts to lose his mind. At the launch of the film, moviegoers notice that as they approach the cinema, some phones are ringing. Yeah? If you picked one of the phones up, you heard conversations, strange conversations, which were described by some people afterwards as sounds of madness. Outside the cinema, a preacher was raving and 
handing out apocalyptic comic books to passers by. Inside, the opening credits prompted the audience to send a text to a given number. And if you did, as you sat and watched the film, you started receiving really weird text messages. On the back of the comics given out by the preacher, this is exactly the comics, were the words, do you want to play a game? If you typed it into your computer, you found an online game that continued the story. In the middle of the game, your phone would ring. It would be the film's hooded villain, who would then start asking you questions like, do you feel guilty? Have you ever lost consciousness? Last year, that's you to tell him your darkest secret. If you were stupid enough to tell him, your answer would start playing back on a loop for your computer speakers. Okay, so now you're a bit freaked out and you want to get out. So you click on the exit box. Nothing would happen. Effectively. Then your phone would get a text. Where are you going, it would say. We're not finished yet. At that point, you'll be dumped into a conference call with an other cinema guys who have just gone through the same, exactly the same experience. As one of the participating, as one of the participants said later, yeah, we were like, what was that? Lance Weller, the creative head charmer, had programmed software to make all the phone payphones on the block ring. The preacher was an actor, and was a lead, was, was a lead character in the film. Based on how you responded to the automated phone calls, the audio and video launched on the desktop screen. The exit box was a fake. Click on it, send me the last text. Send me the last text. The well of the experience demonstrated the fluidity of the audience. After the movie ended, he said, follow people home. You can see how Transmedia can act like a turbo charger in a car, driving your message further, faster, and with infinite more power than before. Is a documentary that uses transmedia tools really effectively.
Hi, everybody. This is Tom Guada, and uh, I'm the director of Collapses the Energy Risk Conspiracy. And I'm going to take you a little walk through of the experience. So, what you're seeing right here is a little introduction that gives you a little taste of what's to come, and um, it just sort of creates a, a context for the experience. Everything's going to the crisis point. It's a full out civil war. Fuel for blood, oil, and aggression. This is an example of uh, transmedia. And transmedia is multiple platform storytelling. This project started out a, a documentary for television about the imminent energy transition from fossil fuels to alternative energy sources. And they came to Submarine Channel to create a multimedia experience that <coughs> attracts a different kind of audience. One of the design choices we made was to approach this using a three-panel system. And the center panel that you see here is the main sort of fictional storyline. And you'll notice that the um, right side and the left side will light up at certain points in the story. If you go to the right side, that's the documentary portion where you'll get interviews with experts in the field or additional blogs from the characters. And then to the left, you will get the interactive portion. They wanted to get the same sort of issues out in a way <coughs> that was going to be interesting to younger people and uh, the, the connected generation. So our idea was to create an experience that's sort of an annotated narrative. What this is is really it's part fiction. It's about these 10 young people all over the world and how this energy crisis affects them. It's part documentary, so you have moments where you can go into actual talking heads and people talking about the issues and predictions, and then there's an interactive component. So there's three components. It's sort of a fiction, a documentary, and an interactive. place you inside the story where you have to make difficult choices about the impending energy crisis. <coughs> Thanks for joining me on this tour. Um, I hope you check out collapses.com. So there's Collapsus, which is part game, part documentary, part film, part um, crime thriller. So, outside what you can achieve, you can achieve with traditional media channels, as you can see, the sharing pathways of the internet, etc. A great many developers have created what have become known as alternate reality games. The IRG is an interactive drama that's played out online and in real world spaces taking place over several weeks and months in which dozens and thousands and thousands of players come together on. It uses real world as a platform and uses transmedia to develop a story that may be, may be altered by the participants' ideas or actions. Here's some examples. The ARG Dreadnought, for example, includes working voicemail phone numbers for the characters, clues in the source code, character email addresses, off-site websites, and real locations in San Francisco. As the technologies have continued to evolve, projects are starting to include single-player as well as real-time multiplayer experiences. Some notable examples of transmitting storytelling include Slide, the Fox TV in Australia, Kathy's book, which is that top left. Which is a transmedia novel. A project by uh, Nine Inch Nails, bottom right, the group. And The Genesis, a Canadian television series with real time alternative reality gaming extension that worked in sync with the episodes. Even the advertising world 
is getting involved. With advertisers and their agencies beginning to embrace transmedia storytelling techniques and search and new communications. New communication channels for their brands and services. One of the areas that doctors was BMW in the USA, they developed a series of short films called, collectively, The Higher. These were produced exclusively for the internet. All eight films used world renowned filmmakers and stars Clive Owen as the main protagonist. Here's one of the better Another song for another 
I got it. I mind it. But they went the real world. Fuck. <laughs> I bet the deal. You don't understand. The aging process is less of my ability to fall. I can't maintain my pain of fortune. Oh, you know where you're coming from? Is it fun? I don't know. Even the fall. I never think what you're about before. <laughs> Uh, I mean, a magnificent series of films, all, the, all cost an absolute fortune. That last one was shot, as you was probably spotted by the, by the late Thomas Scott. Oh, I'm on them. <laughs> I was 
was shot by the late Tony Scott. So what was the transmedia element here? Um, well, during, the last, during uh, 2004, Dark Horse, Dark Horse Comics and BMW got together and published a four-issue comic book, limited series based on the main character of the films. The books were written by Kurt Busiek, Bruce Campbell, Mark Wade, and Katsuro Otomo. And in, 19, in the early, in early 2006, BMW released a line of three BMW audio books based on the higher to take advantage of the iPod MP3 player revolution and the fact that most BMWs came with iPod connectors. Next up uh, is another German car manufacturer who sticks its toe in the transmedia waters. What was the art of the heist? In its simplest terms, it was a spy movie come to life, based around the theft of the first Audi A3 in America. A spy movie that you didn't just watch on screen, but one that you could actually participate in. A story that went from the virtual world to the real world and back. This living movie started with a live theft at the Audi dealership on Park Avenue. If you had been walking by that night, you would have seen two goons smash the window and make off with the A3. You would have seen security guards run after a suspect, hand out wanted flyers, and put up police tape. The following day at the New York International Auto Show, instead of seeing America's first A3, you would have seen signs reporting the missing car in place of the car itself. If you had asked the attendants at the show what happened, they would have shrugged, not knowing themselves if this was real or not. Checking auto enthusiast websites, you would have read bloggers from around the world reporting the story of the missing A3. A few weeks later, you might have noticed billboards, newspaper ads, and wild postings appearing, asking for your help in locating the car. While watching TV one night, you might have seen this oddly awkward yet sincere television commercial. Attention. A series of events has led to the disappearance of a red 2006 Audi A3. If you have any information regarding its location, please contact Audi of America immediately at AudiUSA.com slash A3 or call 1-866-OK-RECOVER. -OK this car is equipped with dual clutch DSG, open sky system, Audi Nav Plus, and two SD card slots. Thank you. Finally, deciding to investigate the missing A3 for yourself, you visit the website, AudiUSA.com slash A3. You would have learned that Audi had mysteriously contracted a firm specializing in the recovery of high-end stolen art, LastResortRetrieval.com, a company run by sexy Nisha Roberts and geeky Ian Yarbrough. Their site contained thousands of pieces of information, all of it seemingly legit. Telephone calls, faxes, messages, receipts, photographs, everything. Further investigation would have confirmed the legitimacy of Last Resort Retrieval as their services had been advertised in the classifieds of high-end magazines for months. To make things a little more interesting, Nisha Roberts even has an admirer who offers to help find the car, video game designer Virgil Tatum, who has his own realistic company and website called virgilkingofcode.com. He was interested in designing a game based around Nisha's exploits, but that wasn't all. He wants to get the car back in hopes of striking a lucrative deal with Audi that would allow him to put their cars into his games. If you had been at E3, the largest video game expo in the world, you would have been able to talk to Virgil, ask him questions in person, see him meet real video game designers, and give an interview in character that was aired on the VH1 Top 20 video countdown. But no matter where you came into the story, you would have met Todd, a blogger who had been intently following the action from day one. A character who acted as a modern-day Greek chorus, neatly and cleanly laying out the information so that you could catch up on what you had missed and continue to learn more. From his site, you might have stumbled onto the viral films hidden in emails, like Easter eggs, that would allow the casual observer to follow the story like a traditional movie. all about the live events that had been advertised in coded messages on Monster.com. Participants who solved these puzzles were rewarded with invitations to live events, 
where they got to meet the characters and help them on clandestine missions in an effort to solve the mystery of the stolen A3. And even after all of that, you would realize there was so much more. But it would have been up to you to decide how far down the rabbit hole you wanted to go. If you had checked back a few weeks later, you would have seen the mystery solved and found out exactly why the A3 was stolen. You would have participated in the largest and most experiential reality-blurring advertising campaign ever attempted. You would have experienced the art of the heist. Something we need to uh, worry about uh, results. Um, that's an example of where you can just where you can go a little bit too far. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's only an eighth thing, you know? Anyway, um, I love that phrase, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? Um, right, right. But it was incredibly successful. Um, and eventually other brands, uh, despite German car companies, had realised that the power of transmedia and decided to get in on the act. M&M's is an irresistible fun snack, but just how far will people go to find them? Google Street View announced that they were coming to Toronto, and that gave us the idea to put that question to the test. We hijacked Google Street View by placing red M&M's in windows across the city, hoping that the camera car would capture them. It did. In November 2010, we created Find Red, a first-of-its-kind digital treasure hunt, where we asked Canadians to find the red M&M's for a chance to win a red smart car. A YouTube video showed how Red got sucked into Google Street View. Honey, have you seen the M&M's? I think they're in the den! Players were then sent to our site where they could start their search. But Toronto's a pretty big city, and players were definitely not going to find the hidden M&M's on their own. They needed some clues. Over four weeks, players got clues on the website, on Twitter, and Facebook. In the real world, we had QR code while postings to unlock special clues. We turned package UPC codes into clues through sticky bits, and Red's Foursquare check-ins also led players closer to the hidden locations. We even had clues in our YouTube video. In the end, the average time spent on the site was over 19 minutes, four times the industry average. In just 30 days, we also got 8.4 million PR impressions, over 7 million QR code poster views, and over 225,000 Twitter impressions, adding up to over 15.6 million impressions. And even though this local game could only be won by Canadians, this didn't stop people from playing and talking about it around the world, making Eminem's Find Red a success nationally and a game changer internationally. Yeah, well, that's basically an example of how it should be done. Okay. Um, the, only, the only clever thing about this was is that they did it before, even before Google had arrived. They had the idea of putting it out. So they had the whole idea even before Google had got to Toronto. Really smart thing. Okay. As a brand. And as somebody who works in the, uh, in the marketing and the communication industry, uh, I think there are three unimpeachable reasons why uh, we should be using transmedia or a brand should be using transmedia storytelling in the marketing mix. The first one is persuasion. Transmedia stories are the most fundamental and immersive form of communication. They engage our brains at the, at the intuitive, sensory and executive level. Audience connection is really important. Transmedia strategies create many points of entry that reach and link multiple demographics and target different user needs to effectively expand the customer base. And financial impact, obviously, transmedia storytelling redefines retail on investments, extends, extends brand shelf life, and creates value added IP assets and auxiliary, ancillary revenue streams. Transmedia also gives brands undeniable ubiquity. It's what I call the Perkins Fry effect. Um, 
because basically, if you're French, you'll get this tune. Uh, <laughs> Sue Perkins and Stephen Fry are just about everywhere. <coughs> In fact, I think Stephen Fry is possibly the first transmedia human being. Confused there, were you? Okay. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is a tra I've worked on several uh, transmedia projects, mainly in the arts arena. That is a, a trailer for, for, for uh, a transmedia project called Love That, um, which was a uh, start of the radio play, uh, is also a documentary, and um, is in the process of being turned into a graphic novel. There's some uh, sort of stills from it. There's a major play top left, the trailer, the documentary is bottom. The other, uh, other one I'm working on at the moment is called Wolf. Wolf is an intense and hallucinogenic look at the banking industry. Bob believes in the process of growing up. This will be a radio play, a film, a prose poem, a graphic novel, and an art installation. That's, the, uh, that's one page of the novel. Finally, Jeff Gomez, who's a leading light in the, in the fledging, fledging transmedia industry in the States, believes the best is yet to come. He says, but we're going to see our transmedia Mozart. We're going to see visionaries who understand the value of each media platform as if it's a separate musical instrument, who will create symphonic narratives that leverage each of these multimedia platforms in a way that will create something we haven't encountered yet. And it's going to be magnificent. I think he's right. But I actually think transmedia will actually make train playing charades really difficult. Thank you. Is there any questions? Uh, well, you, you can use transmedia storytelling in, in, any, in any medium, I mean, in, trans, in any uh, uh, genre or like, platform or something. Um, educationally, well, you can, have a, you can have a play, you can, you can do a book, you can take a play, like a Shakespeare play, for instance, and then you can read, you get some to rewrite different parts so that you get different, different viewpoints in a different, in a different medium, like in a novel or a radio or a novel. So yeah, it does have a plot well, The thing about transmedia is, um, it's basically relatively unexplored. So there's a lot that can be done. We just haven't got there yet. Um, for transmedia, how difficult is it to get the budgets and the team together to work across all those different mediums? Um, it's, well, it depends on the clients. You, you saw the, uh, the Audi. They've been, the, <laughs> interestingly, the, the biggest users of transmedia in the marketing sector have been, have been cars, um, ger particularly German car companies, because they have lots of latest spend. Yeah. And the one I didn't show you is there's the new one from Mercedes, which is called, um, it's an ARG, called Escape the Map. Uh, that's from Mercedes-Benz. <coughs> you saw Audi, you saw BMW, uh, Volkswagen are doing the moment. And in reality, the only, the only people who've done anything significant outside of, of in transmedia, outside of uh, uh, car companies, is, is Master Foods, Eminem's, so or Mars, as they call it. So it, it's 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 difficult because you have to have you have to have so many different players. It's not like a, an integrated campaign where you can create one idea that you just run across platforms. You have to create six different ideas. That's when it starts getting expensive. Mercedes did. I think it was Mercedes did the campaign during the X Factor, where they showed the advert, and then what you tweeted would affect the outcome. That's right. Later on, yeah. so you had this full inter interaction thing. 
but obviously I had to make loads of different versions. On the web you can see all the different versions. So the return on investment must be difficult because you've got to shoot. It's difficult to um, it's difficult to, to monitor in I think in traditional terms. But I think you because you're doing it cross cross platform, you always have to look at diff, all the different, you know, online returns on investment as well as returns on, on marketing investment, as well as traditional, you know, what you get out of the posters and what you get out of the television. And the thing I get most out of it is the fact that you may do something in Canada, but it goes global. Yeah. And that's pretty amazing, I think. Well, you saw, you saw the M&M M &M M &M M &M example of people uh, tweeting from Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, because you can actually look at it. Anyone can go onto the site and find these, these uh, I don't know, Google Maps to find these, these red M&Ms. Mm -hmm. So but people were just treating it, literally treating it as a game, mm -hmm. uh, which is magnificent. And also, it didn't do M&Ms anymore. You know, people couldn't really win in Canada, but then people were buying it because it was in Japan. Because it's expensive and because they don't have the capability it, internally. They, most advertising agencies can do one thing really, really well, or two things really, really well. They can do TV and they can do press. It's incredibly difficult to do TV and press and write a book and do a radio play and do all the other stuff. <coughs> and a game. No, I think they'll just have to adapt. I think it, I think it goes well for, for, for people like students here. Because it means that you know, they're going to have to take more people on to do, to do more bigger things. You won't just be trapped doing one or two different disciplines. Yeah, you want to see no, I mean, I'm, my two examples, the two I'm working on are in the arts area. Um, I think, you know, the marketing, if marketing gets involved, it's going, to be, it's going to be brilliant because that's where, we, where the serious money is. But at the moment, there are only two, there's only one major area of translation is used, and that's in, in cinema. Um, you, saw the, you saw the headshot, for example. But I mean, I mean uh, AI, artificial art, the Steven Spielberg film, was transmedia. Blair Witch Project was transmedia. There's been several, uh, or Star Wars, as you saw, it's just transmedia. That's where most of the focus is. I mean, I, uh, I went to a conference last week, the London Screenwriters Festival, and the American producer said that they don't look for writers anymore in Hollywood, they look for, critic, for transmedia creators. So they're not wanting just to tell up the script, you've got to tell up the whole package. That's where the future is, outside of marketing. If marketing can get involved and get used to it, I think, as I, as I said, it's a fantastic opportunity to, to actually make much more of an impact on the consumers. Do you think that's because of Hollywood's engagement with the games industry? Definitely. Sure. But also, Hollywood's only got, Hollywood's only got one interest in that's going to the seats. If they think they can, rather than sell a film, they can sell 10 things. So these are film, a graphic novel, and a play, and a book, fantastic. If you come up with a whole package of films, they'll love you for it. That's, that's really the driver, the driver behind it. But, for, you know, I can't complain. Okay. Brilliant. I think we'll stop there and we'll have a short break.